Hey everyone, my name is Alex Stapp and I'm the Director of Technology Policy at the Progressive Policy Institute in Washington, DC. PPI is pleased to host US Congresswoman Susan Del Bene, One Redmond, Tabor 100, and the Washington Technology Industry Association for the event today, highlighting the role that technology has played in driving Washington's economic growth and recovery during the COVID-19 pandemic. We're going to talk about the importance of technology platforms and digital tools for empowering Washington businesses Discussion will also cover the need for elected officials to recognize and promote continued economic development and investment in Washington spurred by the technology sector, in addition to preserving the accessibility and affordability of critical digital services that have supported minority owned businesses in particular this past year. Uh, for our keynote address today, I'm gonna to go hand it off to um, Congresswoman Susan Del Bene. Uh, Congresswoman, please turn on your um, video. I will give a brief introduction for you first. Um, Congresswoman Susan Del Bene represents Washington's first congressional district, which spans from Northeast King County to the Canadian border and includes parts of King, Snohomish, Skagit, and Whatcom counties. First sworn into the House of Representatives in November 2012, Susan brings a unique voice to the nation's capital with more than two decades of experience as a successful technology entrepreneur and business leader. Susan takes on a wide range of challenges both in Congress and in the first district and is a leader on issues of technology, healthcare, trade, taxes, environmental conservation, and agriculture. Susan currently serves as the vice chair on the House Ways and Means Committee, which is at the forefront of debate on a fairer tax code, healthcare reform, trade deals, and lasting retirement security. She also serves on the Select Revenue Measures and Trade Subcommittees. Congresswoman Dobeni, thanks for being here. I'll, I'll hand it off to you now for the keynote address. Thanks, Alec. It's great to be here with everyone today. And thanks to the Progressive Policy Institute for hosting this event. Uh, this past year has been difficult um, for so many across the country, uh, Washington families and businesses in particular. The first cases of COVID-19 were found in our region um, in Snohomish County, and the first deaths from the virus in the United States were reported um, right here nearby in Kirkland. Um, so it has been a frightening time, a challenging time for so many and little did we know how much our world would change between now and then. Um, the pandemic has taken so much from us, our loved ones, our sense of normalcy, our economic security. And we also saw how our communities came together to fight back and in many cases use technology as a lifeline. Um, as our state became the initial epicenter of the pandemic, we had to adapt very quickly and our small business community was particularly vulnerable um, because of this outbreak so early on before people knew how to respond. Restaurants and small shops that relied on foot traffic saw their revenue and patrons dry up overnight as people started working remotely. And even in the face of these alarming challenges, businesses started to learn how to shift gears, mainly because there were techno technological tools that were available to them. Um, cafes adapted their, from serving bustling breakfast and lunch crowds to food delivery apps and online takeout orders to help keep the lights on. And those tools were helpful but could only go so far by themselves. And that's why federal action was so critical to meet the scale of the problem that we faced. Congress passed several bills that provided relief to families, to businesses, and our communities. We gave fle flexibility to our local leaders in choosing how to use federal relief dollars and they creatively responded to fit those needs. For example, during the height of the holiday shopping season last winter, Snohomish County partnered with local business and economic development organizations to launch Support Snowco, a campaign and online portal encouraging residents to buy local goods and services. The good news is that now we can finally see the light at the end of this very dark tunnel, but the crisis is not over yet. We're now shifting our attention from getting relief out to how we build our country and economy back better. It's not good enough to get us back to where we started before the pandemic because far too many families and small businesses, um, times were already hard. And so I've been laser focused on recovery and passing the American Jobs Plan. This would be a historic investment in our future so we can get people back to work, rebuild our crumbling infrastructure and turn America into a green economy. Um, and infrastructure is more than roads and bridges. It means making sure everyone in the country has access to affordable and reliable broadband, especially in our rural communities, so they can work and learn from home. 
Um, let's be clear, right here in our region, there are too many people who don't have reliable and affordable broadband. Shifting from in-person learning to virtual education was challenging for students, teachers, and parents. And that's where companies like Screencast Omatic came in. This small Seattle-based tech company offers screen capture and video editing software so that teachers could create more engaging and dynamic lessons for their students. Kids needed broadband to access this and other online learning tools. And it was clear that not all had that access. So an internet connection shouldn't determine if kids can get a good education ever again. Uh, infrastructure also means helping towns and cities implement smart technologies. Um, these devices make our communities safer, more livable, and more climate resilient. A great example is in Seattle, where the city's partnering with the University of Washington and the Argonne National Laboratory to develop a, an array of sensors that go across the city to improve hyper-local weather forecasting and reduce flash flooding. Um, this is a priority of mine because as we build our infrastructure, we need to build the infrastructure of the next 50 years. So I introduced the Smart Cities and Community Act last week um, to make sure that we push to include it in the jobs package and leverage these innovations, not just in big cities, but also in smaller towns. Um, smart cities will be a good way for us to accomplish a forward looking infrastructure. We'll be working on the American Jobs Plan in Congress over the next few months. And I want you to know that I'm working hard to get this done so we can make sure that we have huge opportunities going forward and really a strong foundation for our economy to build on. So while the federal government should drive the recovery, we must do so in partnership with the private sector. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the saying that necessity is the mother of invention. So as we look past this crisis, we should build on the innovations that were born from necessity for the, over this past year and are key parts to our recovery and key parts to um, long-term opportunity. So a few examples, telehealth. Telehealth played an incredibly important role in keeping patients with medical conditions safe at home during the pandemic and continuing their treatment. Um, folks who had trouble with transportation access um, this is a trend that will be here to stay as companies keep improving what types of care can be provided via telehealth. It can range from mental health appointment, from the comfort of your own home, to connecting to a specialist um, that may, you may not be able to access in any other way. Um, these services were available in a limited way before the pandemic, but the adoption has sped up rapidly in the past year. And the federal government needs to seize upon this potential and make sure we align our payment models with these types of services so that they can be provided remotely and address the needs of our communities. We also know if we look at healthcare more broadly, technology can leverage the large amount of data that's available to make sure that we see health trends across communities and demographics also while maintaining privacy. That way we can really address disparities that we've seen in the healthcare system, make sure that we find the differences um, that are out there, uh, even within individual diseases, and make sure that we are able to discover the root causes of these health disparities and how to address them. This information can really help drive federal resources to where they can be used most efficiently. The same idea can apply to climate data and helping protect and prepare our farmers, our critical infrastructure, and each of us from future climate trends. Another key role technology can play moving forward is in our workforce. I'm sure most of us here today have been working from their homes um, for over a year now. Uh, we know that there's going to be changes going forward. Companies can see the ability to connect with a more distributed workforce across the country and see that in around um, as a long-term asset. Some workers will be turning to the office again, and but we know there will be differing types of work styles. Um, it's hugely important for housing and to address other needs of our community if we have opportunities for folks to work from different areas or for a company to attract a different workforce. So again, this is gonna be incredibly important as long as we have reliable internet everywhere. Um, the, I know that Washington's technology companies have been up to the task to leverage what we've built over the past year and come roaring back. Um, tech is a huge part of our economy. We're home to thousands of tech companies, making us a shining example that technology across industries from agriculture to aerospace can be a key economic catalyst. 
And um, I've seen this firsthand from many angles as a federal lawmaker, a state official, and a technology executive and entrepreneur myself. So um, data from a recent study from PPI supports this. Um, it says that we added over 140,000 jobs in the tech and e-commerce industry over the past decade and ranked first in the nation in PPI's tech e-commerce manufacturing index, which highlights the diversification of our state economy in recent years. The relief that we've approved in Congress has been critical to supporting families, workers, and our local economy, but technology undeniably has also played a key role in getting us through this crisis, and it will play a significant part in our long-term recovery. So please thank you again for inviting me to be part of this conversation today. We have so much still to do, but I'm confident more than ever about our ability to come back and lead us into the next century. Um, and I'm so excited about the panels um, coming up next. Thank you. And Alec, I'll turn it back to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Congresswoman Dobene. That was a, a great way to get the event started and we appreciate your time today. Take care. Okay, so now we're gonna pivot to the first panel. Uh, we have a conversation with Washington small business owners. So if I could have Olga, Denise, and Sam turn your cameras and microphones on. I see two there. I have three, great. I'll do some brief introductions and then we can hop to the conversations, the questions and, and have a nice conversation. Uh, so first we have Olga Sagan. Uh, she is the sole owner of the nationally re renowned Poroshki Poroshki. Founded in Seattle's uh, historic Pike Place, Mar Pike Place Market, Poroshki Poroshki has offered handcrafted pies to loyal fans since 1992. She was named U.S. Small Business Administration 2020 Washington Small Business uh, Person of the Year and founded Catch-22 Delivery in March 2020 to connect consumers with local businesses. Catch-22 Delivery is an online hosted direct directory exclusive for small restaurant businesses in one convenient, easy to find spot. Designed and operated by the University of Washington undergrad and graduates, the portal directs customers to existing websites of participating restaurants. Uh, we also have Denise Ransom, co-founder of Altris. Uh, it's a cleaning company in Seattle, King County and surrounding areas. She brings the skills, knowledge and expertise experience gained in her 19 plus years in human resources, coaching and consulting to provide opportunities for others while making an impact on the planet. And finally, we have Sam Cho, uh, Commissioner Cho was elected to the Port Commission in 2019. He is the son of immigrants from South Korea who came to the United States through the Port of Seattle. He is currently the only person of color serving on the commission. Uh, Commissioner Cho was the founder and CEO of Seven Seas Export, an international trading company that was headquartered in Seattle and exported to Asia. All right. Well, uh, Sam, Denise, and Olga, thank you all for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Thank you for Great. having us. Of course. So I'll start with you, Denise. Um, could you just tell us a little the background on your businesses, kind of your origin story? Yeah, it was crazy. Literally February of last year, my business partner and I, Darcy Henderson, uh, we were talking about just providing commercial cleaning, like janitorial cleaning to like the Department of Licensing and places like that. And then of course, what happened in March shut everything down. And so, so were we, right? And um, we pivoted, we made that adjustment over to more of construction cleaning because guess who was still going to work? All the cranes were still, still busy and we were like, we've got to stay afloat or get ourselves afloat. So um, we've got corporate background, I'm HR for 20 years. She was operations and marketing. So this was a new area, but had we not had access to technologies like Zoom and Skype, I'm gonna go there, um, we, we wouldn't have the contracts that we have to this day. We would not be driving the way we are in such a short period of time. But I also, the realities of the struggle um, with regards to the accessibility and the affordability of the different technologies has been really um, apparent to us. And that's why we're even more passionate about how do we help fix that for others, let alone we need some help for ourselves, but we also wanna help other companies as well. Well, that's fantastic. And I've definitely, I've been doing events similar to this in other places and a, and a pattern I've seen definitely is entrepreneurs who see a problem or recognize a problem and say like, I, I could be the solution for that and using whatever technology you have available to do that. And it, that's, that's awesome to hear uh, the way you contributed. Um, Olga, I ask you a similar question. So could you just tell us about Catch-22 Market and how you've utilized technology to empower fellow local small business owners? 
Yes, absolutely. So uh, Catch-22 Market be began as a hub uh, to really show uh, people around Seattle that small businesses were trying. We have our own websites and please avoid third party platforms and go to our own websites, even if it's clumsy sometimes. Uh, and it kind of over the last 10 months and a lot of investment and research and education, it grew into really a user generated platform. So where it is now is restaurants can generate um, content and create e-commerce stores on that platform, but this is not a third party um, owning product. The restaurants own their own product, they own their own customers. But what we're trying to provide is education and simplicity for restaurant owners to understand how to easily put things online, represent their store or the restaurant, as well as providing consistency for an end user, not to having to go to a different websites and logging in or having different experiences and have a consistent experience to going to catch22market.com and getting their product to them. As well as our technology allows home delivery, it allows uh, food truck it, um, events, it allows any other events, in-store pickup. So it's a pretty robust technology that allow small business owners to, to deliver their product however they want to their customer. That sounds great. I think I really appreciate your emphasis on allowing businesses to kind of own the relationship with the customers. I know that in the internet economy, that's the most important thing is like knowing who your customer is, how to market to them, how to reach them. And so it sounds like an awesome platform that enables that. Um, yes. I'll switch to uh, Commissioner Cho. I know that as a former business owner yourself, who's now serving on the Seattle Port Commission, how have you used your past experience to support the interest and growth of the small business community there? Yeah, thanks for the for, for the question. Um, you know, I think the benefit of having been an entrepreneur and a business owner is knowing the unique barriers uh, there are to running and growing a small business. Um, you know, because I ran my own business, I'm acutely aware of the challenges of, of that, like access to capital, uh, regulatory compliance, uh, market access uh, that owners that business owners face. Um, I think this is especially true for first-time business operators, um, but I also have the added perspective of being um, the son of immigrants whose parents also ran a small business and, and provided our, from, uh, for my family through that means. Um, and so I firsthand saw how important things like language access is and other holistic services that are necessary uh, for communities that are underserved. Uh, you know, running a business is, is really tough uh, and it's even tougher to run a business well. Uh, so I'm always kind of thinking about and having at the top of my mind, uh, you know, our small business owners. And when I craft policies at the port, I'm always thinking about uh, our minority women in, uh, and my women owned businesses as well. I think just to provide some like, you know, context here, um, one of the biggest challenges during COVID-19 has been uh, providing assistance that are tailored to the small business owners, right, compared to the larger business, larger corporations and tenants, right? Uh, this has been especially a major challenge for us since the airport is actually regulated by the FAA and FAA rules uh, don't allow us to treat uh, different sized tenants uh, differently. So basically we have to treat the small tenants the same way as the big tenants. Well, you can imagine how this is a problem because small tenants don't have as many resources or reserves or funding as much as big corporate tenants. And so when we tried to go through how do we help these small business uh, owners out to weather the pandemic, uh, we, we couldn't really make that uh, distinction between the small and larger corporate tenants. And so it's been a challenging year and a half for us. Uh, but, you know, I think my experience of having been a small business owner really informs some of the policy decisions we make. Yeah, that's great. I think I'm really glad you brought up uh, the importance of the immigrant perspective, because I know that I've seen a lot of research showing that immigrants start small businesses and high growth potential businesses like like startups at much higher rates than native born people. And so obviously that disproportionate share coming from an immigrant community means that we gotta be really highly cognizant of their needs and how we can support them as well. Absolutely. I, I think the statistic is like 40% of fortune 500 companies are either funded by immigrants or children whose parents were immigrants. And so it's a exactly. pretty significant portion. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's exactly what I've heard. And yeah, it just shows really the importance of, of making sure we have an open uh, society and economy that kind of allows those things to flourish. Um, and so I'll pivot back to, to Denise now. I know Denise, you mentioned a couple of things, uh, online tools you use to support your business. I, Zoom and Skype were mentioned for helping close contracts. But could you talk a little bit more about the online, you know, the importance of the online environment to your business and kind of the tools you use to create success? 
Absolutely. We actually leverage a lot of um, different platforms because it, it helps us sell to the customer, right? So whether it's how we deliver our invoice, our quotes, um, how we make sure that there's an ease of a portal for the customers to request uh, appointments and so forth. So whether that's a jobber, you know, just, but that's a cost. That's an, uh, you know, up to $200 a month in costs, let alone then you have your payroll and how you have to track your employees time and so on and so forth. So really being able to streamline and be easier for us and our employees, but also to provide really up to date, up to the minute information to our clients, right? So um, that's been huge. And I think a really big help to, to really take us to that next level from being that small business to making it give them the confidence that we can handle the bigger bit businesses, bigger opportunities. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and Olga, do you have any similar experiences using online tools? Like what's the vision for the future of your business as it relates to this kind of online economy? Yeah. Well, I actually want to piggyback on what Sam has said. What um, I, I hated technology before a year ago. I, I wanted to take my Alexa and throw it out of the window. And I was so frustrated with everything. And the reason I think I was frustrated is because technology, um, when you go in as a small business owner into technology space, you feel stupid. And I'm an immigrant, you know, English is my second language. Um, and I listen to someone for 20 minutes and I'm like, oh my God, this is, I am completely dumb. I'm not understanding anything. And it's really, really frustrating. So I think the, the biggest thing for me with Catch-22 Market was making it accessible and speak easy language to people who understand, um, who understand the business. And you have to realize that there are so many platforms out there and so much technology out there, but the way it's being presented, it's not meant for small business. You take big Microsoft SAP companies, they're amazing companies, but for small business, we'll have to hire someone who has, who needs to just sit there and figure it out. We can't do it. It's not for us. We need something that is simple, that is accessible, something that does not make us feel stupid because we're not stupid. We're just, <laughs> we're, we're just trying. And as Sam said, small business owner has so much on their plate that, that we need to create technology that streams into everything else that they have and, and, and makes them feel empowered, not powerless. Yeah, I, I really like that you mentioned the importance of accessibility and ease of use. I know that uh, I worked for, before doing policy work in Washington DC, I worked for a startup myself. I realized that a lot of the rise of like software as a service startup companies, so small companies that are making like very user friendly software for to run your business, like can have the ability to replace a full time employee. So before you'd have a full time employee manage some technology or manage some process for you, but the new service works so well, and if it's if it's easy to use, you can like kind of outsource a lot of that to the technology. So that's that's super important for leveraging for your business. Um, Commissioner Cho, I'll just ask you, you know, from your personal experience, could you describe kind of the importance of the online environment to local businesses and the tools you see them use to, to create success? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, Denise and Olga both hit the nail right on the head. I think for most mom and pop shops, COVID-19 has really accelerated the adoption of many online platforms. Um, during COVID, there was dining, uh, dining restrictions and heavy reliance on takeout or delivery. So I think many restauranteurs and retail stores had to pivot towards online ordering and e-commerce platforms to sell merchandise. Um, it, it really serves as another source of uh, and stream of revenue. And obviously every good business uh, no owner knows that diversification is key and you don't wanna put every, um, all, all your eggs in one basket. Um, with that said though, you know, I would love to see uh, some tech platforms really uh, pit, uh, empower the businesses more. Um, I think that there's definitely a lot of platforms like the delivery companies. Uh, I'm not, I'll, I won't name any, but uh, everyone knows which companies take the most commission, all the things. Uh, I think there's been a fair amount of controversy over this stuff um, and being able to kind of um, empower the small businesses so they have a little more control uh, would be nice to see. Um, another area I think that where the online environment has changed local businesses is in local advertising and marketing. Um, we now have platforms like social media that allow you to hyper-target uh, users based on their preferences and their tastes. Um, and this is an extremely powerful uh, tool in getting business on your business on the radar of likely patrons, right? It essentially allows you to reach a wide audience of customers that may not have known about your business 
before, but they're looking through their Instagram or their Facebook and they see an ad for Proski Proski and they make that trip down to Place Market to try it out, right? And so I do think that, um, you know, previously uh, in like the, you know, early 20th century, it was like TV ads that no small business could really afford, right? Or they were really cheap 30 second spots that no one really paid attention to. Now with these online platforms, you can uh, put together a fairly simple uh, ad campaign for a couple thousand dollars and really target people that you know are interested in the kind of product you're selling. So I think that's very empowering to small business owners. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a really important point you brought up in terms of like how these, it makes advertising accessible to uh, a wide variety of businesses that just couldn't, you know, get in the game before. Um, and now they're like their self service platforms. You just log in on yourself and like run your own ads and reach an audience at an affordable rate for a small business. So something I work on a lot in the policy space is like thinking of the trade-offs between like, how can we protect consumer privacy while making sure we don't kind of kill the golden goose of like, this is a tool that a lot of small businesses use. And we want to make sure that they can still leverage that data to, to reach their customers. So that's such an important question. Uh, so kind of the final round here um, for Olga and Denise, I'm going to talk to you about like, expand a little more on like how COVID changed your business and how you're thinking about it going forward. So Denise, I'll start with you again. So um, what, you've mentioned a few of the changes you've had for, for going online and, and, you know, using different tools to communicate with people, but anything else about your business that's changed in the last uh, year and change since COVID started? And how are, you how are you thinking about like going forward once things are opening up again? Well, we definitely changed in the sense of even how we provide service and what kind of services. So we had to pivot to do more of a HAZWOP or really learn about disease and sanitation and cleaning on a whole nother level. Um, but it's really how it's changed for us. We were really more intentional about who we went to go hire and really be focused on those who needed second chances. Those were um, currently experiencing homelessness and really be able to give people a good opportunity to make a really good living. Um, cleaning is, everybody needs something clean. So it's just expanding our initial narrow scope to, to a little bit of not being too broad, but um, just grabbing what we can and really just specializing in, in del delivering really high quality work and giving a lot of opportunities. At the same time, figuring out how do we scale up and use technologies to help us along. Like, like Olga said, we had to sit down with a, an IT guy the other day at $150 an hour for seven hours to try to help get us really in a different space. And for small, and let's even say this, small, using that word isn't even right. Like we're a micro business, not even a small business. So, you know, to spend that much money is, can take a big hit on a, a micro business, but it's essential. So there goes on to that affordability, right? Um, so just being able to tap into all the different resources out there is critical. So we're just constantly trying to find the different avenues that we can get some support financially as well. Gotcha. I hope that that helped. That definitely answers my, helps answer my question. And uh, I, I love your line about everybody needs something clean. So I think you won't be a micro business for a long time <laughs> with, with that tagline. And that. <laughs> right, <laughs> thank you. Help. That's great. Um, Olga, could you just talk a little more about, you know, how the pandemic has impacted your business and how you're thinking about things going forward? Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, we're generally in the restaurant industry and the food industry, we're a little bit late to the table on technology altogether, not just small business, but now, you know, we're the restaurant industry. Uh, so I think, you know, last year when you see your sales going up down 90% after, you know, almost 30 years of working very hard and and realizing that it's just disappearing and it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it, how good you are, everything's just gone. And then seeing third party platforms just pick it up and take all your income away was heartbreaking. <laughs> so, so I think us uh, really, um, and a lot of businesses shut down and just waited and, and Perushki, Perushki and myself, we kind of did opposite. I mean, we just uh, gambled away on technology. We, you know, put everything we had into technology and understanding that we need to meet our customers where they are and not just us, but educate, you know, everyone around us that it takes a village. Um, and, and really by this, by January of this year, we had the busiest January we ever had. 
and realizing that online is not going anywhere. Home deliveries are not going anywhere. And I will be thankful to those third party platform. Actually, they, they brought price up so high for a consumer that businesses like us, we have a lot of room to, to kind of help ourselves out there and deliver it ourselves. Um, and just educating people, look at um, big brands like Pizza Hut or Domino's, they've been delivering forever. And they're not using third party platforms, they're doing it themselves. So I think we really need to start taking our power back and not afraid to, to kind of um, prove our business you know, from different danger and, and getting to know your customers. It's really is powerful. It is a lot of work, don't get me wrong. Learning online, marketing, people take your business completely different. You need to adjust your product sometimes. It is a lot of work, but the reward for it is incredible. And consumers do, consumers going to third-party platform, not for third-party platforms. They're going there for you. And you have to realize that, that they're looking for you, not paying somebody somewhere to do something. So if you if you can offer them consistency and customer service and really connect with them, that's the key. Um, so please, I hope all small businesses can realize that we need to start educating ourselves. We need to get out there. We need to own our own customers. And uh, because the more years gonna pass by, the worse it's gonna be, the harder it's gonna be for us to get into that space. Gotcha. I, you know, I totally agree that I think the online sales channel is augmenting your previous business. It's not going away. And you said something you can use to build to grow in the future is, is the right way of looking at it. Um, so for the final question for the panel, I'll hand it to Commissioner Cho. Um, if you can close this out, I'd just love to know how can leaders like yourself um, leverage insights into the small business community to support community growth through education and the value of technology? Yeah, that's an excellent question. You know, I think uh, first and foremost, it's mainly through advocacy and good policy. Uh, I think the advocacy and, 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 and policy from larger corporations is there because of the capital and resources they have access to. But small businesses, um, especially the minority and, and women-owned businesses, do not nearly have uh, as much voice in, I think, the sausage-making process, so to speak. So I think it's up to those experienced in the small sector to really help be that voice or amplify those voice. People like me who are in the policy space uh, creating policy, even if it's in my corner at the port. Uh, we, I'd like to think that the port sets a precedence uh, that a lot of other local jurisdictions uh, might turn to or use an example. I mean, again, it's, it's, it's understanding that not all businesses are created equal. And, and when we talk about equity and inclusion, we're really talking about providing resources to those who truly need it to thrive. Uh, so, you know, what part, part, part of what makes me uh, very proud and excited to be at the Port of Seattle is the fact that our mission is to promote economic growth in the region. And my focus in particular has been making sure that growth reaches the little guys uh, to make sure that, you know, as they say, the rising tide lifts all boats, uh, especially as, as we come out of this pandemic and look towards what we like to see an equitable recovery. Uh, you know, we're looking to see how the port can uniquely contribute to that recovery. You know, um, just some of the thing, one thing that I'm looking at that I think is really interesting, the Congresswoman mentioned infrastructure and broadband. Uh, I know this is a slight digression, but the, the, Port, Act, the Port of Seattle actually has uh, broadband authority uh, and it's given to us by the state legislat legislature. So it's actually something that I'm, I'm pushing my colleagues and my staff to look into to see what the port can do to contribute to broadband access. But it's stuff like that, right? Making sure that the resources are given out in an equitable way. Because at the end of the day, I think uh, the easiest way to, des to describe equity is really the inequitable distribution of resources. That's why we fight for equity. Uh, and so uh, that's what I'm focused on. And that's what I'm trying to do as a policymaker at the court. And I have many conversations with my counterparts at King County, at the city of Seattle, on the state legislature level uh, to promote those as well. So I'm really looking forward to see what innovative policies we see coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, that sounds like a recipe for success to me. Uh, so I appreciate closing on that note. Um, thank you to the panelists for panel one. I appreciate your time, y'all. Thank uh, you so care. much. Thank you. Of course. And it will move to panel two now. We're gonna have a conversation on economic development, technology and policy. Um, Christina, Darcy and Molly, if you could turn your cameras and microphones on. I see Christina, I see Darcy, I see Molly, perfect. Just do brief introductions um, for the audience here. So we have 
Christina Hudson uh, is the executive director of One Redmond. Uh, she's a hands-on leader with over 20 years of experience in economic development. Christina is committed to growing Redmond's local economy by work working with businesses, educational institutions, local and state government, and surrounding communities to ensure that the region remains a leader in innovation and technology. She spends most of her time out in the community meeting with world-changing local companies. Her expertise is making sure Redmond businesses have what they need to grow and to expand. Hudson has received two international awards and her work is used as a model for establishing technology hubs and industry clusters around the world. Uh, our next panelist is Darcy Henderson. Uh, Darcy is the executive board secretary um, who organizes all board and membership meetings and oversees the membership and public affairs committees for Tabor 100. Uh, Darcy is a seasoned professional with over 17 years experience combined in marketing, operations, consulting, and coaching. She is known corporately as an effective leader and results-driven influencer. Uh, and lastly, we have Molly Jones, who is the Vice President of Government Affairs for the Washington Technology Industry Association, where she leads the association's advocacy and thought leadership on policy issues impacting Washington's technology sector and the communities it serves. Previously, she was a Vice President at the Asia Group where she advised clients on corporate strategies for market entry, expansion, advocacy, and social responsibility. She also led a range of corporate social responsibility programs to promote sustainability and women's empowerment. Christina, Darcy, and Molly, thanks for being here today. Thank you. So I have a few questions that I kind of want to get all of your perspective on. Um, so uh, Christina, I'll start with you on the first one. We know that the technology landscape in Washington state is vast. Um, could you speak to how business leaders like yourself are working to promote an entrepreneurial innovative environment that attracts investment and facil facilitates growth? Sure, absolutely. Well, um, I think as we're looking and taking our steps into economic recovery, um, we all realize that innovation is a key component of that. So um, as, as an economic development professional, you always want to nurture innovation. So at One Redmond, you know, we have a good partnership with our surrounding cities. So Redmond, Kirkland, uh, and Bellevue, we have a interlocal agreement um, and a brand that we call Innovation Triangle. And that that is our branding that we use to recruit to the world for, for our larger companies talking about our, our big innovation cluster and, and the world changing technologies we have here. But it's also about supporting the small innovate, small entrepreneurs and uh, we, we have a small business development center. Uh, we just launched a One East Side Spark initiative, working with small businesses as they're coming out of the pandemic. And, you know, at times of high unemployment also um, breeds a lot to entrepreneurial activity. So really giving these entrepreneurs and small businesses support as they're starting their businesses, I think is, is really key. And I think, I guess, the third or fourth part of that would be advocacy for R&D and making sure that we're continuing to incentivize research and development because that is where our, that's where, where, where the new innovations of product and services will come from. Thank you for that, Christina. Darcy, can I get your perspective as well on what you're doing to kind of work to promote an entrepreneurial innovative environment that is good for investment and good for growth? Yeah, a lot of things that we're doing right now is providing a lot of different workshops and working with um, different um, financial institutes because we found out that wherever the money resides is where th that's where we're going to help um, the minority businesses. So we work um, very closely with Seattle Credit Union. They've helped us out really greatly during the pandemic with PPP, making sure that our members were well aware of what was going on during that time. Some of them were not able to get it, but we still made a way where we're able to um, build a relationship. And I think that is one thing that um, has hurt minority businesses is that the relationship with financial institutes um, was not there or it was pretty weakened. So we continue to do that. We also have started a, a fund called Black Business Equity Fund, where we've been able to award different um, companies their businesses to help give them some legs to stand on, especially during this pandemic. And that has been exceptional um, 
I'm not part of that committee, but we've been able to um, really help them to build up their businesses so that they can have a brighter future. Because right now, um, a lot of things have been devastating throughout this past year, and we're just trying to do something where we can give hope. So we um, have companies that have donated to us, um, like the AT&T, Seattle Credit Union, Amazon. So that has been a great help for our, our members. That sounds sound like some great initiatives. And Molly, I just want to get your perspective as well, you know, from the Washington Technology Industry Association. What are y'all doing to, you know, support an entrepreneurial pro-growth environment out in Washington? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we have over a thousand member companies here in Washington. 80% of those have 20 employees or fewer. So we're really sm- focused on kind of the, the small business startup uh, entrepreneur side of the equation as well. Um, and we we're really trying to bring together the whole ecosystem. So the, the investors, the entrepreneurs, the corporates, uh, the universities and government to kind of build the ecosystem holistically. And as a, a central part of that, we're really focused on workforce development. So we run uh, a nationally recognized tech apprenticeship program called Apprenti, bringing folks from underrepresented backgrounds into technology careers. And we have also recently launched the Anti-Racism in Tech Pact, uh, actually almost about a year ago, to kind of uh, increase diversity, equity, inclusion in the tech sector in our workforce. So we're you know, re- really looking to strengthen in those areas. That's great. And I know that um, from our next question, Congresswoman Del Bene, and I think someone on the first panel mentioned infrastructure. Uh, obviously there's a big infrastructure bill that's working its way through Congress out in Washington DC that could come with a, a lot of money to be invested across the country. Um, and so Christine, I'll go back to you to start, but I wanna get everyone's perspective on this. Um, how have the companies that make up today's digital infrastructure, thinking of things like IBM, Google, Microsoft, others, these like large technology companies, how have they changed the landscape for economic growth? That's, that's a great question. And, you know, it's, it's important to know that these are the companies, as we heard from our earlier panel, that really has been supportive of our economy. So we haven't fallen as far, you know, as we could have during the pandemic. Um, but yeah, I mean, it really opened up uh, the access uh, to all. I think, you know, two companies I want to throw in there is uh, SpaceX and Project Kuiper. You know, these are two companies that are putting low level satellites in, in, our, in our atmosphere uh, to be able to provide provide uh, more broadband and high speed internet access uh, to our um, underserved communities. And I think, I think that's something that, that could do, um, could absolutely change uh, some of the areas that, that don't have those services and we'll see a lot more entrepreneurial activity, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for those as well. I think I've always been skeptical of like, how do you get that last mile connection in rural areas? Like laying fiber just does not seem economical when you run the numbers on these things. So it's kind of satellite networks. I'm really optimistic about that, like solving that last mile problem for, for rural Americans. Well, and SpaceX first first to trial at that was right here in Washington state. So it's, it's really great to see it actually get some legs. Yeah, and I've seen like test results, people post to Reddit and stuff, like I think 130 megabytes down um, from the satellite. And I'm like, that's better than I get in Washington DC sometimes. So it's, it's really incredible um, yeah. what they're able to do. And so Darcy, I wanna get your perspective on this as well. How do you think about digital infrastructure these days um, especially in terms of reaching these like hard to reach communities or underserved communities as well? Well, the companies that are doing it, um, they're going full steam ahead. I do think that the access is still not really readily available for minority businesses. And that's what we need. We need more access. We need more training so that we can understand what the digital, t- digital tools are and make those things available to minority businesses. Um, it doesn't mean that there's nothing that they, they, that they can't do, but they need to have um, more influencers as in, in business leaders being able to bring that information um, so that they can be able to use it and get more hands-on um, with it. So I think we need some more access to it and we need more funding for it. And just so we can get a better understanding for the digital tools for to help their businesses to run smoothly. Gotcha. I know Molly, you mentioned that a majority of your membership are those small, small businesses, startups, entrepreneurs, that kind of group. Um, but how do you all think about kind of the larger players in this digital infrastructure and how they fit into the ecosystem? Yeah, you know, I I wish I don't have that like, you know, reactions button on my Zoom screen, but I would have, you know, thumbs up or applauded the the things that Christine and Darcy were saying as well, because I I fully agree with that. You know, from our perspective, the 
the large players really provide uh, kind of a really strong flow of information and resources into the region for you know startups in the broader innovation economy here. They really build the expertise, they diversify the economy, they provide that source of economic stability that Christina was mentioning, and uh, they share resources. So they're you know driving our economy toward you know blockchain, AI, quantum, uh, AR, VR, and they're really the leaders in this space that support the broader innovation ecosystem all the way down to startups as well. Gotcha. Uh, Christina, I want to talk a little bit about economic development next. Um, so similar to this digital infrastructure thing, but I want to kind of broaden the scope a little bit. So I know that in Washington, a lot of these investments that tech companies make include things like data centers, fulfillment centers, office locations, they're hiring a lot of jobs. So how does that fit in with like a, a vision for future economic development in Washington, in your opinion? Well, you know, it's interesting because of the pandemic and the changes, people can work from home and they can work from anywhere. So it really has changed the way that businesses are hiring and working with their employees. So it, it, there's a lot more opportunity for those uh, more remote areas, um, or I should say not remote, not non-urban areas, um, to be able to have a workforce that is, that is working in tech. And I think that's, that's going to be one of the greatest changes we see moving forward. Gotcha. Darcy, I'd love to just get your opinion on this one as well in terms of like, how are you thinking about the investments these companies make in terms of what parts of them are beneficial or not? What could be most helpful in terms of like facilitating broader economic development in the state? Well, with Tabor 100, we've had a lot of different um, companies who have donated to us and that's how we function off, off of the sponsorships. People like Seattle Credit Union, Cornerstone, Vulcan Group, those dollars are helping businesses have some feet to be able to walk and be able to um, really build up their businesses. So I think it's very important and I appreciate those companies that are um, pouring into minority businesses, especially through organizations like Tabor 100. So I say, keep on doing it. <laughs> we still want more money. We want more of the funding coming because um, as we receive that, we're able to provide technical assistance to our members, providing workshops, getting other people to come and speak to them. Um, it helps them to grow their business. And that's all we really want to do is make sure they have feet and be able to walk and not give up. Yeah, I'm with you. Let's keep it coming. Let's get the V-shaped recovery going. Um, so I'm all for that. Um, and for the last part of the conversation, I want to pivot towards policy. My favorite area, I'm a little biased working in public policy here in DC. Um, so Molly, I'm going to ask the first one to you. I know that we all know that technology is under a national microscope as heated policy debates take shape across the country on a range of issues from how certain companies moderate content, handle data privacy, or just exist within the larger tech ecosystem. And so Molly, you know, as conversations continue among lawmakers, both in Spokane and in here in Washington, uh, DC, um, about the role of technology and the nature of technology in today's economy, what would you like to see as a part of that conversation? Yeah, I think that's that's an interesting question and certainly something we're we're thinking a lot about uh, in terms of the tech uh, policy nexus right now. I would say, you know, there's kind of like two two main things. The first is a real recognition of the role that tech plays in economic development and growth. And so, how from a policy perspective, how can we partner with the tech sector to kind of bolster, um, you know, high paying jobs, job creation, growth, uh, and equity across all of those parameters? So really approaching it from a partnership perspective would be key. And also we're in a period of increased regulation for the tech sector. You know, I think uh, we've had the opportunity to work on it here in Washington, as well as at the federal level. And, you know, I think many tech companies are asking for regulation. I think there's some areas that, you know, it's pretty clear that that framework is needed. And at a high level, you know, wanting to do that at the federal level, so they don't have to deal with this kind of patchwork of state level regulations. Um, but in the absence of that federal regulation, we've worked on many issues here in Washington, for, you know, from privacy to even data center tax incentives to the previous question. So, you know, I think being sure to include companies in that conversation so that the regulation achieves the desired outcome and also enables innovation to continue. Gotcha, yeah. I'm very sympathetic yeah, to the patchwork arguments, but then I, I hear people, people at the state level say, you know, if there's gridlock in Washington, D.C. or nothing's getting done, like, what are we going to do? And so I kind of see both sides of that. And that's why I was glad to see that Congresswoman Del Bene reintroduced uh, a piece of privacy legislation this cycle. And hopefully there'll be more <laughs> action and activity on that. So we'll, we'll keep pushing them in that direction to, to get things done at the federal level. Um, Christina, I'd love to turn to you on the, for the same question in terms of um, in the policy conversation, 
again, in Spokane and in Washington, D.C., um, what would you like to see as part of that? Well, I, I echo almost everything that Molly has said. I mean, the WTIA really leads the effort in, in this. Um, so I, you know, I think um, it's, it's a hot potato topic, right? Depending on who you're talking to. And I think, um, I think it'd be really great to have some, some policy that's at the federal level uh, versus having to try to deal with all like the patchwork that we were talking about earlier. Gotcha. Well, that's great. So, so Darcy, I'm going to give you the, the last word on this one. So whatever you say goes in terms of policy. Um, what do you think is missing from the conversation? What are people getting wrong? Um, what do we just need to hear more about in terms of public policy and tech? Well, I believe with the, both the ladies, um, again, right? But we, I think we need to ensure that every small business owner can participate equitably to get the most value from the platforms as far as economic opportunity. Um, it's essential and it's a collective journey to recovery. I agree 100%. That's a, that's a good way to end it. Um, so Darcy, Christina, Molly, thank you for your time today. And I appreciate um, learning from you all. Um, and so with that, I will wrap up the event. Um, thank you to everyone in the audience for watching today and hearing from our keynote address from Congresswoman Del Bene and our great panelists on our two panels. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in and take care and we'll see you later. Bye.